Welcome everybody. So this session is on how to start a career in health disparities. I think most people were here for the for the past session, but still, if if somebody just joined, my name is Maria Espinola. I'm a clinical psychologist and assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and in Behavioral Neuroscience. Next. And uh, basically, I, I put up the location for each one of us because I know that many students hopefully are joining in and early career professionals, so they may want to know about what our credentials are, particularly the ones who are applying for internship now in residency. So um, here's what happened. So I, I it doesn't say it there, but I actually completed three years of psychology back in Argentina, which that's where I'm from, Patagonia, and then I emigrated to the U.S. Um, by myself with like $500. I was 20 years old at the time, and if, so I couldn't go to school right away. So I took some classes in community college. I taught myself English, eventually taught, uh, took classes in community colleges, went to Nova Southeastern University for my PsyD. Then I went to the AP accredited internship at the Center for Multicultural Training in Psychology at Boston University Medical Center, which was an amazing experience, the best training experience ever. And, and then I went to do my postdoctoral fellowship at McLean Hospital in Harvard Medical School. Okay, so joining me today are like two of the best students I ever met in my life. <laughs> so Jenny and Caroline. So let's start with Caroline. Hi, everyone. my name is Caroline, um, and I am coming to you from Madison, Wisconsin, where I'm a family medicine resident in our Department of Family Medicine and Community Health. I did all of my education in Cincinnati and have such a warm spot in my heart for that place and all the people who've taught me there. Um, kind of first got engaged in health disparities more from a global health perspective and then really have enjoyed working with people like Dr. Espinola on looking at Latino health disparities, looking at kind of interventions from the clinical perspective. Um, and I currently work at a federally qualified health center um, as a resident and I'm excited about that world. Excited to. Thank you. And next is Shani Sanduan. Hey, Shani. Yes, um, I am uh, Dr. Jenny Zanduan. I received my bachelor's in psychology from the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. I end up, uh, ended up obtaining a PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, same as Caroline, I had a really wonderful, wonderful experience during my PhD, which I know is not something that people usually talk about, like uh, about their graduate experience, but it was wonderful, particularly because of my lab and my mentor um, there. I ended up doing my clinical internship in the same play where the, Dr. Maria Spinola did. It was actually her recommended uh, completing an internship there, had a really wonderful experience. And now I'm a research fellow uh, with uh, Dr. Maggie Alegria at the Disparities Research Unit at MGH and Harvard Medical School. Awesome. Thank you, Shani. <laughs> okay, so what's going to happen today? So I made an outline basically on um, just starting to think about all the issues that are important to keep in mind as you are getting ready to start a career in this field. And then the type of conversations that I have had with mentees and students. So I put that like different topics here, but this conversation is open. If something else you want to speak about something else, you can uh, send your questions and we'll, we'll address it. If we cannot address something today, uh, we will keep that in mind and get back to you after. But these are the main topics. So one is finding the why. So why do you decide to do this? What's your purpose, your meaning? Then finding the who. Who are going to be your mentors, your advisors, your sponsors? Because it can't be just one person. So, um, so we're going to be talking about that. Then finding the how, developing the goals, whether it's clinical, research, policy, and getting there, applying for internships, uh, residency, and fellowships. So the next topic will be overcoming external and internal barriers. So that's sexism, racism, xenophobia, and imposter syndrome. And finally, taking care of yourself. So what are the type of things that you can do to make sure you survive this? Uh, you not only survive, but hopefully thrive. And make it 
So next. let's start with the why. So this is a, a quote that I really like. So it's the idea like he who knows why can bear with almost any how. So this comes from existential perspective. And I, I, I've been a fan of this quote for a long time. But I, I remember when I was struggling just as an immigrant, like new immigrant coming to the United States. I mean, I kept thinking about why you know, my why, you know, what I was doing, what I was doing, what I wanted to accomplish. So that like kept me going. So it's really important in that regard, if, from my perspective. And it's also important as you preparing to apply for residency and internship, because I had had this conversation a lot when I review essays. Um, there are some essays I focus too much on the what the person is doing, but they are not talking about the why. If you do have it, it's important to kind of like bring that to life. It, it can change an essay significantly. So here we're going to show a video from uh, Caroline, and it relates to her why. One is extraordinary. Caroline Hensley's her name. She's a University of Cincinnati medical student with this lofty goal. She's helped open a free clinic for people who don't have health insurance. Here's what she told me about the people she cares for. We were just so intrigued by your story and it's so relevant today I, i'm just wondering what did you see or hear about that helped you recognize this was an important need that needed to be filled yeah so before i started medical school i was working in a federally qualified health center um, and i was working with a lot of patients who were coming from pretty far away and were coming because they didn't have other options where they could be seen because they didn't have insurance um, and i saw that there were a lot of there was a lot of care that they were seeking in the emergency room or other places where they weren't getting the best care that they could because their needs were more of a primary care need or something where um, we could be help thinking about preventative measures. Um, and so I really saw that disparity in what services these patients needed and what was available to them in their communities where they lived. So tell me about the clinic and tell me about the people who come there. You know, what are their most urgent needs? Yeah, so the clinic, we have this amazing relationship with the Healing Center, which is an organization in Cincinnati and Springdale specifically, um, that really aims to treat people holistically, taking care of food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, and we've partnered with them, in, and we have a wonderful relationship with them, and we have people from all different walks of life coming in, um, and some people looking for really support and kind of social support and thinking about how their social um, barriers are affecting their health and other people who are coming in more with kind of upper respiratory systems who um, really don't know what to do that they're kind of in a crisis and we're able to help um, connect them with either patients that they need the supports that they need or if their um, status is critical sending them to the emergency room or whatever wherever might be the most appropriate place for their care. Can you even envision what it's become already at this point when you started this? I think there were a lot of moments where we saw a lot of hurdles, where we saw a lot of um, barriers, a lot of resources that we needed that we weren't sure how we were going to obtain. Um, so no, there were definitely moments where our team had said, oh my goodness, I don't know if we can keep pushing through, um, but it's been so worth it and um, certainly become something bigger than we thought it would be. And I bet to all of those people that you're helping too. Caroline, thank you so much. Good luck with everything. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so that was, uh, so I I met Caroline about four years ago. So when she was, a, a, so four or five years ago, when she was a first year medical student. And, um, and it was just really inspirational for me because she basically showed me a, a flyer. It was like one page flyer that she, she made and printed out and it was basically about her idea of doing this steering run free clinic and at the time i saw it was amazing and i was just very inspirational but to be 100 percent honest i was like i don't know if this is if this could really happen because uh, i already knew about all the barriers and uh, yeah and the, all the obstacles that uh, we're gonna have to go through. So, um, so yeah, it was a really, really difficult process. I mean, I can't even explain how difficult that was. But and this relates to what Dr. Alegria mentioned in the morning was that the perseverance. So, so I know. So Caroline is brilliant, but besides that, like just being brilliant would not have been enough. Like she's incredibly uh, 
perseverance. Like it's, it's as amazing. Like the the number of times that she had her no, it was incredible. Like one after the other, but she continued to remain hopeful and calm and and you know just consistent in what she wanted to do. So I don't know, Caroline, do you have a comments? Yeah, thanks for having me watch that. It's been a while since I watched myself on there. <laughs> um, but I think something that someone told me like in one of these meetings um, where like I was discussing how many times we'd been told no, um, I had someone who, you know, like your approach just needs to be, thank you, I hear your no, like next, like move on. Um, and I think that's really helped me just both in thinking about the clinic, but then thinking about efforts that I'm involved in now here in medicine of just like, thank you and i'm gonna move on like thank you for listening to me i understand you're not interested and i'm gonna find the next person who's more interested um and i feel like that's always gonna be something i'm working on of like building that perseverance but yeah yeah so yeah so i said that a lot yeah because they said actually uh, the song thank you next yeah you kind of like want to keep that in mind <laughs> when you go through this process because there's like so many people who are going to tell you no and jenny's going to mention about the research side of that right like just submitting to journals and getting rejected or submitting for for grants and getting rejected i mean that's just part of the process so so the more um open you are to the no's <laughs> the better you're gonna be so just kind of like assuming that that's going to happen so then you want to hear what the response is to figure it out what's going to be your next move whether it's the next person or the next idea or the next change or the next review but it's always next yeah so my uh my why is a little bit uh different because i think that in order to talk about why i do health disparities work i really have to go back like really really back in time and talk about my family's migration history and, and what really motivated me initially to immerse myself in the field of what was called like multicultural psychology which is like has been shifting since i started 12 13 years ago so the next uh, uh I, sh I show a little bit of slides to show you where my parents migrated from they're from the southern part of china my my family was very poor they're mostly farmers they came from this uh city called Guangzhou, this area in China called Guangzhou, and they decided to migrate to Colombia, to South America for, for uh, greater opportunities. And oftentimes when I talk about this, I really do not even visual, because I did not do that journey. I did, I rarely visualized the long, long, long distance journey that they had to endure, but also how, you know, I talk about this because I, they often talk to me uh, about their migration history and how difficult it was for them to assimilate from a Chinese um, culture with little education to move to Barranquilla, where I was born in South America, and how their diet changed and how the, the, the cuisine changed and how they even related to people changed because of the migration process. Three, uh, when I was three years old, they moved from Barranquilla to uh, Bayamón, Puerto Rico, which is where I grew up. And um, I stayed there almost my entire life. I even did my undergrad in Puerto Rico. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the challenges that Maggie referenced also earlier about because, like uh, obtaining the education in Puerto Rico. And people are like, where is that? <laughs> and uh, like that, not really valuing um, my experiences um, because of my educational experience. Um, so when they migrated uh, to Puerto Rico, obviously, even within the jump, I mean, it seems like a very small jump, but it was a really significant jump for them, for them and for my for myself too. migrating from Puerto Rico, uh, from Colombia to Puerto Rico, even though they spoke the same language, uh, Spanish, even though the, uh, we were uh, I grew up, I was born in the Caribbean side of Colombia. It was so different, predominantly because uh, Puerto Rico is part of the U.S. So even the educational system, the diet, I mean, the the way people relate to each other, the, the you know, physically how, how Puerto Rico was to Colombia was also very different. And, there, and then my parents talk about the second wave of adjustment for them um, migrating to Puerto Rico. And um, I was three when they moved, so I don't I don't remember much about Colombia. So I lived like vicariously through them and really had to believe that they were they spend a majority of their 20s in Colombia because a lot of the things that they would cook for me, even in my own home, were Colombian cuisines that we, I, we really didn't even find outside of in Puerto Rico if I wanted to, unless if I went to a Colombian restaurant. I talk about this because then when I ended up in the University of Puerto Rico, some two things happened at the same time that really, really shaped 
my life and my career choices. I was an engineering student, like a lot of Asian uh, children, <laughs> and I was taking a psychology course and two things happened kind of simultaneously. One of my family member was uh, hospitalized uh, for psychiatric reasons. And I remember going to the, to the hospital and asking them, so what have you been doing uh, in the hospital? And they were like, I don't understand why, but this person keeps coming in and asking me to close my eye and envision a beach and they keep doing this every day. And for me, you know, I am, I identify as Puerto Rican. I, I said, well, probably because it's relaxing, but it put this into perspective because my family member grew up in a rural China, do not associate, even though they spent most of their twenties and thirties in, um, in, in Puerto Rico and, and Colombia, they do not associate the beach with relaxation. It was such a confusing experiment, uh, exercise for them. So at the same time, I took a psychology course. It was an elective for me and I was reading the books. And this is like where the difference between Colombia, I guess, I don't know, and Puerto Rico is. I was reading a book of psychology and I was um, going through the exercises. I was trying to understand like, so where, why are we using a book of like how to treat psychological problems with studies that are a hundred percent white people this is puerto rico like how where 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 are the studies with puerto ricans like what i'm sure it's different so these two things really started making me ask a lot of questions to the point where my professor was like i don't know i don't have the answers so i was asking myself how do we um increase the the ethnic racial representation in the textbook literature the textbook the literature is that also are used in the u.s because the u.s is becoming more diverse and how do we actually shape the way we deliver psychological care to people that are not white that are maybe not even um you know from a different context and context can be like what about people like that grew up in rural areas this so those started my my quest to like into health disparities because just quoting something and I know that uh, Dr. Alegria mentioned it earlier is that health disparities are also differences and gaps of quality of care and she gave a lot of uh, examples of how you know culturally adapting um, treatments was important to, in order to meet the, the, the needs of diverse population. So after asking a lot of people um, the conclusion was that if I want to increase the literature on racial ethnic minority psychology, and I also wanted to change how care was delivered, the, one of the one of the avenues was to become a research uh, a researcher and a clinical psychologist, which I am now. <laughs> Thank you. That's amazing. That's amazing. And then this one is just a resource because I mean, obviously, in one hour we cannot cover everything that you should be like thinking about while preparing for this. So this is a great, great resource, a TED Talk that talks about the why. So in and he actually is talking about businesses and how why Apple became more successful than other computer uh, organizations. Uh, so the idea is like other ones like focus on the what we do computers so apple went more into the why we want to change the world <laughs> and that people bought into that he bought into the idea of the why people don't buy what you do they buy why you do it and if you talk about what you believe you will attract those who believe what you believe leaders hold a position of power or authority but those who lead inspire us whether they're individuals or organizations we follow those who lead not because we have to, but because we want to. We follow those who lead, not for them, but for ourselves. And it's those who start with why that have the ability to inspire those around them or find others who inspire them. Who? Cool. So, so the who is just like finding who are going to be those people that are going to help you get there. So I think a really important point here is that you need to ask for it. <laughs> and it sounds like very simple, but a lot of people don't do it, especially women and especially minorities. Just they, they don't ask for it.
Uh, so, so that's why I talk to students a lot about asking it and putting yourself out there and be ready for a no and you're going to be okay after you hear it. It's going to be fun. There's going to be a lot more other people and you're going to continue and move on. But you will be surprised at how many people actually will say yes. It's amazing. So the example that I usually give because it's a, uh, it was very early on, so I didn't even have a master's at the time, which, you know, I was at Nova Southeastern. And I wanted, I wanted to promote a specific cause, a specific project, and I wasn't getting that support. So from the people I had around, so I saw, um, let me find like who is the most powerful person <laughs> in this university who is Latino or Latina. So I looked that person up because, I, so the thing is like, you may happen to meet this person eventually, but I wasn't going to take any chances. I was like, I don't have time, I need to get this done. So I looked this person up, found him, identified who he was, and he was a vice president. And he, I found, was doing this uh, lecture series that uh, people could go. I mean, the only people who will go, it was usually will get attended by 10 people or something. And those 10 people were usually deans, administrators, I mean, just leaders in, at the university, no students. But there was nowhere in the announcement that said students could not come. <laughs> it's just like, just the students wouldn't think about it, but yes. But so anyway, so the, the students weren't expected, but they were not, not allowed to come. So I felt that that was enough for me, like enough for invitation to, for me to make it there. So I prepare, I like wore a suit, I uh, got ready. I first, I looked at what he had done already for the university. What was his interest? And I, I showed up there, introduced myself. I basically told him that what I wanted to do. And I also told him, you know, the university has 29,000 students and I, and you don't have any students at the table. And I think I can bring that in. I can bring the student voice. <laughs> so he, for like a few seconds, he was just like in shock. After the shock, he was like, you know, like that's that you're right. Like that's uh, nobody. I have brought that up and uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think, yeah, you should you should be here. Um, yeah, so I'm like, yeah, okay, great. So I'm gonna sit at the table. I sat at the table game and some people, even they were like leaders of the administration were sitting on the sides, but I'm like, I'm coming all the way here. I'm sitting at the table. And then um, I went to, I was uh, invited to be the speaker. And then like, I would get invited to galas. I would get like asked for, you know, opinions on different issues that were going on at the university. So I, of course, I took the risk of being rejected, but you know, what's the worst that could happen? He would have said no and then I won, right? So so I think that was like pretty fundamental because it changed. So first it increased my hope a lot about what I, what I was capable of doing. It also gave me an amazing role model to follow. He was amazing at networking too. And so he directed me to the right people. So it was a really definitely life changing for me in terms of my career. And then it's a two way street, uh, this idea of like the mentors, the sponsor, the advisor. So you always want to think about like, what is it that you're bring, bringing to the table? And then what I see very much is the, the attitude from my students. I'm like, I'm this little person. I cannot like I have nothing to offer. But, you know, at the time, so I, that's why I gave that example, because I was that little person. Like I didn't have uh, just credentials at the time, but I could offer that. I could offer the voice of someone who didn't have those credentials and who didn't have that power. So if you think about, so the power comes in many forms. Sometimes you have power because you have credentials. Sometimes you have power because you have money. Sometimes you have power because you have numbers. So there were 29,000 students at the university and I had already founded a student organization and that allowed me to connect to a lot of them. So. So that gave me power. So like, so it's just figuring out like, what is your power? Because it could look di very differently. Yeah, I yeah. wanted to add something to that, uh, two, two things to that, actually. I was um, just uh, speaking with Maggie a couple of months ago about the first time uh, that I reached out to Maggie. She was already at, uh, here at uh, Boston, but I had just graduated from uh, the university. I wanted to take some time off just doing research, so I like reached out to her. This was 10, 11 years ago. I reached out to Maggie. I was like, you're one of the few people that are doing research <laughs> in, in psychology. Do you have any positions? 
But actually, I uh, learned a lot about Maggie and, and, and was connected because I, I worked with people that were doing like health disparities work in Puerto Rico that worked closely to Maggie. So I am going to echo that and just like reaching out back then. She didn't have any positions, but now I, I ended up did uh, working with her. So um, just reach out to people if, the, if you don't. Um, you know, if you don't know how to get access to someone, I always also try to think about people who are associated with that person. Maybe that's a better, a stronger connection. Like I'm connecting you with this person I've worked with. Um, and and those are, are, are always good. Be, I mean, I, I think I it was Brock and Brenner. I think I emailed them once, uh, you know, a couple a long time ago. This is a extremely like stylish. Uh, this was a long time ago. So just like uh, reaching out to people and just like Maria said, uh, you know, one of the things that I was talking uh, about was when I came to Cincinnati, I, I wanted to get a, a really good training experience, but also my mentor also benefited from, from me accepting into the program because I was the only native Spanish speaker in the academic community partner. So that made really a, a difference. And she talks about this openly. Um, so so always, you you even if you're a student and, and even if you're a trainee, you always have something to offer and always like market yourself that way. So in order to do that, you have to know what you have to offer, right? To the other person. Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Shady. I just wanted to add from kind of like the medicine perspective of really not being bound to like a certain specialty as you're thinking about mentors and as you're thinking about people who are doing work that you're interested in and committed to, especially in the vein of health equity, like work that's moving across specialties. So by providing a different experience or a different interest, you are benefiting that person in just like broadening their work. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> okay. Next. Yeah. So I love this quote. So it's like the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. <laughs> so just like keep that in mind, like always when you really have no power, it's just like think again, reflect. Okay. But this is a video that I did with Dr. Latrice Montgomery, who is a, a co-worker and she's a researcher. So um, she, we did this several videos on different topics, but this one is really inter it's interesting in the sense, uh, in reference to this presentation specifically, because she talks about mentorship, wellness and academic success. This is the how. So the how is like I was born in Patagonia and I briefly mentioned this at the beginning, but it's just I immigrated to the US. It was a very challenging experience, very overwhelming. So this kind of like I was trying to find visuals to what it like really felt like. I don't think anything could like really describe what it felt like. Um, but it was just a very, very challenging experience uh, to come as an immigrant and not being able to speak the language and like having all the other different different barriers in terms of finances and everything else. So let's move on. But that really kind of like um, shaped me. So in one way, I mean, it was incredibly challenging, but at the same time, it's like when I experience challenges now, I can look back and say like, I was able to survive that, I can survive anything. So it's kind of like the immigrant perseverance is just like, really amazing. So in many ways, I do identify a lot. So I know that my experiences are very different than every other immigrant experience. But I think that um, what I see very often is like the hard work uh, mentality, the perseverance mentality, it's just the hope, right, for a, for a very future. So in terms of how you make it in academia specifically, what I did was just to listen a lot observe other people, think about people who look like me, who made it and ask them. It was helpful though to find people who had Latino background who are in academia. And then I started looking at their CVs. So what were they doing when when they were my age? So this is something that I recommend always to students. It's like whatever your field is, if it's medicine, if it's psychology, it's just like find a leader in that field and look at their CVs. You know, find the leader that you would like to become one day and then look at their CVs and go down all the way to where, you know, where you find a, when they were your age around that and then see what they were doing. So, so I realized that when I was looking at those CVs, I would see these different sections on the CV that I didn't have myself. So like owners and awards or like grants or whatever. So that gave me an idea of the type of things that I would like to obtain in the future. So I made this fake, fake CV 
which is basically a, it was basically a guide for me of the type of things that I, I need to be I needed to be thinking about in terms of publications and presentations and everything else. So I think that that was helpful. I think one of the things that I really struggled with towards the end of medical school was figuring out like the specialty and figuring out like who are the mentors in the different fields. And I think something that has come about in the last like year or two of really just recognizing that like my work in health equity and my commitment to underserved populations is not dependent on like what type of medicine I'm practicing. Um, and it isn't dependent on really like what exactly my mentors are doing that I'm finding mentors to help like sponsor me and to help guide me in the right direction. But um, as I think Dr. Allegra was saying earlier, like there's this young group of people who are like interested in health equities and who have different experiences that I think sometimes older generations don't have and don't have like the exposure and even just like the theories that have begun to be taught in medical education. Um, so finding ways to like find people to support you, but be confident in like the novelty of your like novelty of your commitment to health equity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is a picture from the Center for a Multicultural Training in Psychology, and Dr. Allegri is actually there. I don't know if you can see her at the center, but um, yeah, so that that training for me was amazing. Just the, the experience, the personal, personal and professionally. So I do recommend a lot of students to go there. I actually, so when Jenny was a student, I introduced them. Um, so I took, so it was a dinner. I think we went to when we were at the APA conference. So um, and and it's helpful, I think, to meet people from that program. So I was also fortunate to meet people from that program before going there because it made it more real to me. Uh, it gave me a better idea of what the program was about. And then I don't know if Dr. Alegria wants to say something about that. Uh, wow. it, it is an incredible program. It, it really is. I, that was, you know, one of the times uh, I was blown away by the breadth and the commitment they have had. They have a history that's amazing. Uh, and if you look, many, many people like Jenny and others have gone through that program and really made uh, strides in their career. So I, I, I couldn't say more, Maria. It's a wonderful, wonderful program. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next. And then now she... Yeah, uh, so I'm, I, my, uh, my trajectory has been very research intensive. Um, so when I, when I talked about the earlier experiences where I was asking all the professors, how can I do achieve this? How can I change the books? How can I, we, I, I influence the, the way psychologists practice? Um, someone recommended me to someone, uh, a psychologist in Puerto Rico. Uh, his name is um, Guillermo Bernal. So he had, he had a, a National Institute of Mental Health T34, which is a two year intensive uh, program teaching students how to do research. So I was recruiting into that program. I am, I was paired with a psychology, uh, with a psychology professor uh, mentor throughout those two years. Uh, and then during the summer internships, I would travel to another to other states to to re do research in other institutions. It was an ex incredible, incredible, incredible program. I know that uh, other programs in the U.S. like McNair has similar structures and other programs uh, um, all over the U.S. But this was incredible for me because not only did I get really immersed in the psychology literature in the racial ethnic minority psychology literature, it also started connecting me to people um, that were doing these important works. And that's how I first learned about Dr. Alegria's uh, work because uh, it was not a really big community. I don't think it is still a big community, people doing disparities work. Like, you know someone and that person obviously like knows, like there's a, what is it called? Like a second degree usually or a first degree of person uh, doing this type of work. So uh, a, a, a similar thread across these experiences for me was um, I was always focusing on racial and ethnic minority psychology. Like I said, there wasn't really a lot out there. Maggie was one of the very few people really doing uh, racial ethnic minority psychology uh, uh, research. But, uh, but these two years were extremely important to me because I took away two large things. Uh, first is that racial and ethnic minorities are understudy. Culture and context are rarely considered when developing uh, re developing practice guidelines. And then the third thing for me as an individual, as a human being outside of myself as a researcher, is that really I wanted to pursue a career that I can operate within this social justice framework. That whatever I did, whether it's teaching, whether it's research, whether it's 
community work, clinical work, policy work, always operate from this social justice framework. And that was very important for me in my identity development as a person and as a professional, because it really guided my next decisions about where, where to go to study, where to do an internship, where to do postdoc. Um, so one of the things that I, uh, one of the things that I, uh, that made me decide to go to Cincinnati was because one of the things that I learned from those two years doing undergrad research was that um, part of the reason what we, uh, part of the reason why racial and ethnic minorities are underrepresented in literature um, is because they don't trust us. They don't trust researchers. They don't trust a lot of clinicians. How do we engage them? So I saw the greatest opportunity to really work with my mentor and really change my life, um, Farrah Jaquez, um, because she was doing uh, community-based participatory research, basically really partnering with community members and it, deciding jointly what are some of the priority areas for Latinx population in Cincinnati. And for three years, I worked with these wonderful group of, of women where we uh, did a couple of research, research studies under trying to understand where people were going for their healthcare needs, what were some of the health priorities that the community saw were most important and how did we change it? So it really changed my way of thinking about research because rather than just myself looking at numbers all day, it really made me develop this relationship, listen, change my agenda and um, you know, as a researcher to mirror what is important from the community. And I think it's a great avenue to really uh, make, their, uh, make the community's voice heard through research. This method is, uh, was a really good match for myself. Okay, and then I, uh, I, I, I ended up going with Maggie and I think that my work, I, when Maggie said something earlier, I, I, it really stuck with me. It says, mentor, uh, go to places and mentor that value the work you do. When I talked about the community uh, uh, academic partnership, not everyone really was like, you know, into it. But I, when I met Maggie for the first time in person in Boston, she was really excited about this community academic partnership, obviously because her lab was already doing that uh, to some extent uh, or in a different way. So uh, going to a fellowship, accepting a fellowship position from someone, from a mentor that really valued this type of work, and understanding that it's very difficult and very time consuming to develop these relationships. And sometimes it really works against this academic um, academic timeline you have because you want to publish, 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 get more funding. But, but these relationships, like any relationship, if you're in a partnership or even friendship takes time, right? So really having someone that values that type of work and, and, and knows how to maximize your potential as a community academic part, uh, researcher was very important. And then the last reason, and one of the major other reasons that I wanted to work with Maggie, besides the fact that I've always admired her work throughout my life, is that she already had two research R01s that partner with policymakers. One of the challenges as a clinician myself and, and in Cincinnati, I was one of the very few clinicians that did Spanish speaking um, in psychology and psychological interventions in Cincinnati was that even if I, even if we did a lot of community uh, driven effort, there was a lot of policies that really were impeding for Lat the Latinx community to like uh, advance forward the way um, I envisioned it. So it was very important for me to kind of scale the research up a up a notch to be, be able to influence policy in a meaningful way. And it, it was very, um, you know, prior to working with Maggie, it was for me, it was like, I'm not going to talk to a policymaker. But now that I am talking to a policymaker through interviews and all that, it's really not that scary. You just need someone to kind of push you in the right direction. Um, so that that's one. And then I'm not going to get into the my personal research program. We can talk about it separately, but I'm, I'm, for, I'm developing my research program looking at childhood adversities and biological markers of stress and substance use, which is very different, but I'm trying to complement my research with this community academic model, uh, which is, we'll see how it goes. Thanks. So um, I think some of the things that I was thinking about as I was kind of figuring out my next steps after medical school, I'm going to back up for a second. Throughout medical school, I think it has been very difficult. It was very difficult to be focused on, like, I'm pursuing this degree, this um, this expertise for the purpose of advancing health equity. Um, just because that's very, like, not 
the piece of medical school that is, there's no focus on that. Um, and so I had a very hard time figuring out how do I continue to develop that interest and develop that expertise. Um, and for any medical students who are here, um, I think one thing that really helped me was trying to keep in mind that like health equity lens in every piece of medical school. So both in the classroom, um, anytime I like had an opportunity to present, whether it was on like gastroenterology or surgery, like focusing on like, how can I find the piece of this that is related to like my overarching goals? Um, and so like presenting on, um, like the global health disparities in like surgery and like the accessibility of different surgeries that people need, um, to like First for myself of like figuring that out and knowing that data myself, but then also having the opportunity to present that to like the surgical residents, to my peers. Um, and just, I, I think that was something that really helped me develop kind of a broader understanding of where I wanted to go within the field of medicine health equity framework. Um, and then as I was like approaching thinking through residency, I think the three things that really helped me think through what was important and where could I go, where I could really continue to um, work on addressing the social determinants of health and um, caring for minority populations. Um, but thinking about A, the setting. So like thinking about the setting of the clinical training where I would be practicing um, and making sure that I was in somewhere in a location, both in the hospital and in the clinic where I was seeing diverse populations and um, addressing kind of barriers to care. Um, and I found programs where you were doing that and that was why everyone was there and everyone was like jazzed up to be there because they were all focused on uh, health equity. And then other places where like, I could have been okay and would have been the only person who like had that framework of going to this location for that purpose. Um, and so really just being able to identify that and think through that um, and finding the people who um, kind of fleshing that out through interviews of like, what is your commitment or like, what, what do you know about the patient population here? What do you like, what are the things that are happening here around health equity and kind of finding ways and in interviews to talk about that and ask about that, um, and kind of gauge the, um, commitment of different programs and different mentors within different, uh, family medicine programs about that. Um, and then also just keeping in mind kind of the, the time piece of, um, a program that commits time to whether it be pursuing um, clinical rotations in different settings, whether it be like rural Wisconsin and like a tribal clinic, um, more going to a different country, um, whatever it may be, but making sure that there's the time and the space um, for those things to be pursued, um, as well as thinking about like research time and advocacy time as well. Um, those were kind of the pieces that I considered as I was looking towards residency and being able to kind of continue the work that I've been doing. Thank you, Caroline. Next. This one over from various, and we're getting close to the end, so we're going to go really fast on this one. Uh, but it's basically um, just talking about barriers that are external. So racism, sexism, homophobia, um, xenophobia. And then so this, the structural barriers and the, the barriers that come from society that prevent us from moving forward can impair us from moving forward. And then there's also the internal barriers. So I don't know, Caroline has something to say regarding uh, this specifically in regards to, so I know Caroline, like I, like I mentioned, and, uh, one thing is that she tends to be very, very humble and she tends to like not so all those pictures that you saw i put them there <laughs> with her permission but i basically looked them up because i knew she wasn't going to be sending any she wasn't def definitely not going to be sending me one on her words but i had them i added them because they're important and it's, it's important that you know how to um basically brag a little bit because if you don't nobody's going to figure it out what you achieve and that is gonna significantly like seriously can prevent you from moving forward in the field because people already think less of you because of your gender sometimes or because of your race or your ethnicity so don't give them more ammunition like so so it's basically keeping a balance right but it is important that people you make you make your uh, achievements known <laughs> So, oh, and let's take another picture actually because I love that one. Move on to the next, the next uh, slide for a second. So, the next slide is the yeah, so the Grace Anatomy type of picture. I think it's a piece that has been really helpful in like kind of overcoming that of just like I, I think I grew up in this very like 
conservative traditional household of like my mom does the cooking and my dad does the other stuff and you know um a piece of that that i think has really helped overcome is kind of considering that like my work is really valuable and that my um if i'm not sharing my accomplishments and sharing my um kind of successes then it's allowing someone else who probably doesn't have like the same drive to care for underserved populations and to like kind of stand up for health equity. Um, and so I think that's been really helpful as I've worked on trying to be bold and like sharing what I've done and how that's important and how I would like to continue that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. So one thing that I wanted to say, so in regards to, you know, how to make it and how to overcome barriers. So one big thing that was mentioned by, in, earlier in the presentation, but it's just the idea of like finding the right people. So Dr. Alegria mentioned it. But it's just the idea of like finding a support system. So in my case, I, I didn't have it at, at the University of Cincinnati immediately. So I work with other people to to build it up. So two of them showing the session today. So so we're co-founders of the Latino Faculty Association. But those are the type of things that you can do if they are not already there. You can build them, right? But it's just basically finding ways to overcome the barriers in every every way you can. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next one. And then this is a resource that we also did with Dr. Montgomery, and this has to do with how to deal with imposter syndrome. So I definitely want to like recommend you watch it. It's on YouTube. The per, the pros and cons that Maggie mentioned and uh, some of them, the funding limitations um, is the big the biggest one. I don't know if you uh, were in the beginning of a presentation. It's like I have nothing to disclose. The health disparities field does not come with extra money, <laughs> and that is true. There is limited funding, and and the funding that is available. But the good news is that, for example, for the loan repayment program, they increase the funding for health disparities um, line a lot in the past year, and they're going to keep increasing it. So if people uh, incorporate disparities in their research and their program and their clinical work it will become more uh fundable i think that's my hope at least um the cons also have publishing high impact journals i have received a nice word and not very nice words how maybe the, the type of work i'm doing is not important and it's not um uh, applicable for the majority of the population, but I find myself always like struggling. Well, if I'm uh, using an all white middle class sample, I'd have to justify that doesn't this doesn't apply to to minority under uh, underserved population, right? Um, and then uh, in in general, like work not being perceived as important, and or or maybe like um, you know. Um, trendy or not scientifically rigorous is another other other types of uh words that i've that, that i've heard like if i do qualitative work which is important with underserved understudied population or if i do community-based participatory research um that for some scientists has not is not perceived as important and that could ultimately maybe in my career um affect me in terms of my promotion and ability to move forward but there are a lot more pros like being able to have a um a strong relationship with community partners and members and people who have lived experiences is important. Having more research buying from understudied population. I did a really, really ambitious dissertation study where I collected saliva from um, uh, Latinx adolescents, half of them were undocumented immigrants. But because there was a lot of trust in our lab and my work and my lab's work, I was able to access a very, very vulnerable population. Uh, but also uh, another pros is an opportunity to shape practice and policy and being able, the most important one for me as a human being is I'm able to build a career that aligns with my personal values. What I, I wake up in the morning and sometimes I really don't want to work on a paper, but it really goes back to like, well, this is important because no one has published this or no, no one talks about this. So this is important. It really aligns well with my, what I find important in my life. Awesome. Thank you. Next. Yeah. And then finally self-care, which is extremely important. So next. So this is just like some basics for self-care. Uh, that you, we all know about, but sometimes it's just like, you know, it's easy to forget when you get like very overwhelmed and you're facing a lot of challenges, which you will face. So it's just kind of like assuming that you will face those challenges and getting ready for it. So you're not shocked or surprised. Okay, next. 
And then I do have, so I made this uh, YouTube channel, which he, where it has a lot of like self-care uh, videos. It has one video that talks about balancing advocacy and self-care. And I definitely wanted to touch on that. I think that because we care so much about these uh, marginalized populations, it's almost like, I mean, it's, it's natural that we also feel very intensively with everything that's going on. And when they when we see injustice, when we see people being mistreated. And so, so it's normal to want to advocate, actively advocate for them. And it's important to find a balance, right? Because you don't want to dedicate so much to advocacy that you don't leave anything for yourself and you start struggling and not functioning well anymore. So you want to balance it to a point where you're taking care of yourself, but you're also um, advocating and, and doing what you want to do when you believe is right. So these, these uh, YouTube channels serve several purposes. Another one was because I've seen a lot of trainees who were influenced in English or Spanish and wanted to serve other populations. So what I did was uh, I created these videos that are in English or Spanish and with techniques that are therapeutic. Okay, let's move on. And then uh, our contact. So like for, for you to reach out. So we got to the, the, the end of this presentation, but we are available uh, if you have questions, if you want to get back to, uh, to us uh, with comments. And I don't know if you're going to have like some uh, final thoughts, final messages, Jenny and Caroline. Just thanks for listening. I'm very happy to talk with anyone who has questions, both within medicine and outside of or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, none for me. I, I see that uh, Rebecca uh, Castellanos is uh, asking a question. So I, I would love, for, in terms of advice for international student funding opportunities, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, um, Maggie's uh, lab and the lab where I work, there's a lot of us, um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of my peers are not uh, green card holder or citizen. So I could give you more information if you email me um, directly. I'd be very happy to connect you with those opportunities, but I do know of some. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. So thank you so much for joining us today. Just uh, make sure to stay in touch, stay hopeful, stay healthy. <laughs> Bye. Have a good day.